And it's 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening. Wherever in the world you're watching from, it's Business Morning live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. Great to have you join us. Let's uh, take a look at what's happening uh, with the markets. Now we see oil prices seesawed uh, this morning. Uh, we've, we've seen that uh, happen in the oil market. And we see a seesaw going on right now in positive and negative territory on Tuesday, holding up despite recession fears and potential uh, new COVID-19 curve in China that could dampen demand as the market remains tightly supplied. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude uh, is about four cents to $120.89 a barrel early trade, while Brent crude futures dipped about six cents uh, to $122 a barrel, still quite elevated. Uh, supply tightens has uh, been uh, aggravated by a drop in exports from Libya amid a political crisis uh, that's hit output and ports, while other producers in OPEC Plus struggle to meet uh, the production quotas, and Russia faces banned on its uh, oil over the war in Ukraine. And back here, the Purchasing Managers Index for May stood at 53.9, down from 55.8 points in April. The headline PMI signaled a 23rd successive uh, monthly improvement in business conditions in Nigeria's private sector. Uh, new orders continue to rise sharply, which prompted a quick, uh, a quick expansion in headcounts. In turn, sentiment improved with companies also hoping that fruitful marketing campaigns would support output growth over the next 12 months. Private sector output at Nigerian firms rose for the 18th month in a row during May. Although solid, the rate of growth softened from April to an eight-month low. All four of the monitored subsectors recorded marked uh, expansions led by the manufacturing sector, services, wholesale and retail, and agri agriculture actually followed behind, respectively. Uh, firms continue to raise purchasing activity with expansions now seen uh, each of the last uh, 23 months. Input inventories held in the Nigerian private sector expanded solidly in May, thereby extending the period of growth to 23 months. Strong demand encouraged firms to increase their stockpiles. I said the rate of expansion softened from uh, that scene in April. And mainstreaming uh, fisheries and agriculture into national agricultural and investment plans, both at the national and regional levels, is described as a tool enhancing the subsector's contribu contribution to uh, national development. Uh, speaking at a meeting in Abuja, the director in charge of fisheries and aquaculture at the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Meomo explains that protecting its value chains also remains key to addressing challenges of youth unemployment and shortfall in foreign exchange earnings for Nigeria and the African Union. Do take a listen. Nigeria is a very large country and uh, we need about 3.6 million metric tons per annum. But we have to produce between artisanal, industrial, and aquaculture only 1.2 million, million metric tons. And the deficit is being supplemented, let me use the word supplemented, by frozen fish importation. So frozen fish importation is being used to bridge the gap. Not actually that we are going to have 2.5 million metric tons brought into the country. But we have a situation that, you know, let us just supplement this with frozen fish importation so they'll be able to have a, a leeway, you know, for the farmers to have something to eat. Before frozen fish is brought into the country, we have what we call cash certificate. We have to certify where are they bringing this frozen fish from, what is the health status, how is it being stored. Is it being stored in a very good environment? The cool room, we inspect the cool room. We have inspectors in Lagos, Abuja, Lagos, even at Kado Fish Market here in Abuja. We have an inspector that will go there and certify that the frozen fish is being brought in a very good condition and it's good for the country. Welcome back now to our first uh, conversation. The federal government's uh, total borrowing from the Central Bank of Nigeria uh, through Ways and Means advances uh, rose from 17.46 trillion naira as of December 2021 to 19.01 uh, trillion naira as of April 2022, according to data from uh, the CBN. Uh, this represents an increase of about 1.55 trillion naira within the first uh, four months of 2022. Let's uh, talk to Mr. Bismarck Rouhani now, CEO. Financial Derivatives Company, join us right here in the studio. Good morning, sir. Great to have you. Good morning. Nice to be here. Yeah, so th this conversation about ways and means, it's been on, you know, for a while. And now we're sitting at 19 
trillion naira. Should we be worried? Uh, I think we should be probably alarmed mm. because 19 trillion naira is probably about almost 35% of total money supply. And if that amount of money is being borrowed unilaterally from through a process which actually is uh, unorthodox or awkward, then we need to straighten it up. So what does that mean? It means that your debt service requirements, when it's now properly restructured, will be higher. And the ways and means is another way of weathering inflation. Inflation is already projected to increase to about 17.8, official inflation. But anecdotally, we see higher numbers. And inflation is not just a Nigerian-specific issue. It's now a global issue. You know, cost push factors, global supply shocks, and foreign exchange pass through. So you don't, you just make things worse if you don't actually bring about a structured and orderly way of managing your debt. It cannot be done in this arbitrary and ad hoc manner. And, so it, it's a problem. And uh, talking about uh, how risky is it compared to external loans? Well, no, external loans have external burden. Obviously, as your currency adjusts, then it, the, the Naira translation of your foreign currency debts become higher and magnified. But the thing is that we've canceled out on the euro bond program, right? Because people, people don't lend into a political cycle. Now, so that's one issue. But that mix of debt, one, the nominal debt, two, the, the mix of debt. But the most important thing, what did you use the debt to, to do? For consumption, for subsidy and all of that, that's totally unproductive. So the chickens will come home to roost eventually. But again, we are in a political season. So uh, June, Democracy Day was yesterday. And um, you know, people are uh, delegates and um, other are deploying their spoils. Exactly. So uh, we've seen the Naira strengthen because the spoils are here, and people are uh, delegates and candidates because in some cases delegates, both candidates, were all um, motivated in uh, extraordinary ways. So that we see, we are seeing the results. At least temporarily, it gives the Naira a little boost, but. We'll see how it goes. But with all of that electioneering you know, activities, how is all of that playing into you know, inflation? Well, the thing is that inflation, I don't think that uh, unproductive cash injections is inflationary. And that just makes the situation worse. But the reality is that uh, you ask yourself the question, the African countries want stability before democracy or does plural democracy, that is elections, mean stability? The reality is that, uh, you know, we challenged and um, democracy uh, is actually defined in so many ways. But the cynical way of looking at it is that a hundred fools cannot make a wise decision. <laughs> and a million zeros will give you zero. So what you see now is um, pre-convention politics and post-convention politics. Pre-convention politics are about delegate procurement. Post-convention policy about reaching the people and the, the demogra demogra demographic divide and the average age of the asp aspirants compared to the median age of the governed uh, was a real problem. But like Harold Wilson said, seven days is a long time in politics. We have eight, eight to nine months coming. And so many, there have been so many surprises between now and when the elections play out. Quite interesting. And talking about, you know, elections, the next president, you know, they have a, a lot of work, you know, to do at this point. Looking at, you know, this ways and means uh, number right now, external debt ballooning, you know, at the same time, what are the actionable plans the next president should be taking, you know, when they take office? You see, when you get there, like they say, what you see is what you get. What you don't see is what gets you. So, you know, you don't go into this job. This is not a job for interns. You go into this job well prepared. And if you, if you are not well prepared, the result will be uh, catastrophic. So, and this time you can't afford. Uh, and so, the, I think the, the answer is actually people get your PVC and vote your conscience, or vote either you vote your conscience and you get the right outcome, or you sell your conscience and you get the unintended consequences and that everybody pays a high price. So, go vote your conscience. So there's a big price to be paid, Absolutely. you know, at this time. No. All right, let's uh, look at the, you see the U.S. inflation, that one keeps hitting new highs. It's a 41-year high, Yeah. <laughs> you know, at this point. What do you, how do you see this uh, 
uh, uh, uh, moving the, the Fed's this, the next uh, decision uh, rate making? Yeah, they meet tomorrow. I am not a betting man, but I think that you will get 75 basis points, or maybe in the extreme, 100 basis points. But I think 75 basis points will, 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 will mm -hmm. do the job. When you do that, then you go back to say, what are the com components of this inflation? The big component is the price of energy and fuel, right? It's going, average price of petrol in the US is about $5.50 per gallon, which means about almost, almost $1.45 per liter. If you convert it into Naira, you know, it tells you what it is, right? That's almost 1,000 Naira per liter, okay? Now, what's happening? <clears throat> One, the Iran deal, I understand it's being cooked. Something will happen if Iran, if they do the Iran deal, then the Iranian oil, 2.5 million barrels coming in, is a game changer. What more? Biden is going to Saudi Arabia. You know, if they say the, if the mountain doesn't, if, if if the mountain, if Mohammed doesn't go to the mountain, the mountain, or if the mountain doesn't come to Mohammed, Mohammed will go to the, go mountain. To the mountain. So when you see the most powerful man in the world going to Saudi Arabia, it means that he wants to do a deal. So if those two things happen at the same time, the price of oil could come down to what we call manageable proportion. It's now 120. 122, who knows? It could come down to maybe to 100. Even that, for Nigeria, we should be in the money. But it's, again, a tale of two cities for Nigeria. You know, heads you lose, tails you lose. When the price of oil increases, we don't get the revenue impact. When the price of oil increases, we feel the cost. So it's you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So there's work to be done. So yeah, I don't, a lot I, of work I don't envy whoever is coming. Yes, I don't envy central bankers at this point either. They have a tough decision to make because there's also stagflation. You know that word's yeah. been thrown around a lot. You know at this mm. point, do you think it's gonna it's gonna get to that? No, I don't think so. I, I think a lot of this is politically because the midterm elections in the U.S. is November, so people are banding all sorts of terms. Stagflation means very stagnant growth and spiraling inflation. I think inflation is almost peaking and starts declining. Growth is going to recover. The U.S. lifted the restriction on testing to, uh, on Sunday. And the travel industry, all the JetBlue, uh, Alaska Air, American Air, all their stock prices, uh, the hospitality, the Marriott's and all of them are also growing. Their stocks are going out of the roof. So I think that you're going to see an exaggeration of things in the right direction, and therefore, uh, global growth will pick up because it just has to. And I, maybe there'll be some discussions between uh, Putin and the Ukrainians and everybody to, because it's not in anybody's interest for this to continue indefinitely. Right, and we've seen, you know, major sell-offs in, you know, global markets and yes. <laughs> even in the crypto market, we're seeing Bitcoin hit new lows. Do you see these markets cooling off, you know, these sell-offs anytime soon? Yes. Two, three years ago, we had COVID and markets went. Now we are in what they call the bear market. Just imagine what happens if tomorrow the Fed increases interest rates and the markets are satisfied, right? The stock price is the present value of future earnings. These companies are doing well, right? Look at how they are performing. It's quite interesting. And I think that uh, there's a lot of upside. Uh, I'm not speculation. Uh, you, the crypto and the bitcoins and all of that are speculative assets, but they also serve a purpose for payment and transactions, convenience, and it's a new world order or world disorder, if I may use that word. Right. And therefore, it's not for the fainter. It's when, it's when the tide is up that we know those who are swimming naked. So we'll see that. <laughs> yeah. We'll definitely look out for that. Uh, let's uh, look at uh, another slide uh, from uh, you there. We see the uh, performance of some Nigerian banks. banks, you know, for the first quarter. Yes. Uh, how, how do you see the, the uh, performance? Well, at the beginning of this year, we thought the banks were toast, that they were done, right? But uh, we've seen some very interesting trends recently. I think uh, it was about done. Um, it sold down, but uh, if you look at the banks, the tier one banks are doing very well. Um, Twelve of them have released results. It puts a total of 275 billion naira. Um, but the most important thing is their cost to income ratio, which has shown that they are bringing it down, not, not as competitively as the African counterparts, but they are now bringing it down. The 
big risk of the Nigerian banking system is that they have euro bonds and the price of because the interest rates are going well, and they have to refinance some of these euro bonds at a more expensive rate in foreign currency. We may have that. And God forbid if any of them defaults or staggers, then there could be a problem. The but we when we look at it, we, we like what we are seeing at Zenith Bank, we like what we are seeing at UBA, and we like First Bank actually surprised because, you know, they had their boardroom issues and all of that, governors, but they've come around and they brought their cost to income ratio down from 79% to 67%. That is phenomenal. We've also seen that they've restructured certain things. Basically, they, I think one or two of their loans, which were shaky, have been restructured and that has helped. So you'll find that they, they've actually made a recovery, a recovery of bad loans working. Some governance structures are being put in place. There are still challenges, mind you. Um, they have good geographical prints, but branch network means nothing these days. It is converting into a digital channel for consumers. And they've actually grown the consumer, their businesses were pretty strongly. I, I never used to think that First Bank was, that was my mother's bank and all that. But uh, recently I've seen a lot of people say, okay, First Bank is actually the, Pioneer Bank, they started over 120 years ago. But they've kept, they've become, they've remained relevant and they've been able to reinvent themselves and compete. Just like all, all the other tier one banks, they are across Africa. Uh, UBA has over 22 branches in Africa, the only bank licensed to do business in, in the US. But I, I think Nigerian banks have shown resilience so that even when international banks come into this market, they've been able to withstand their shocks. Have they right. challenges? Now they're going to be cannibalized by fintechs, by telcos, and all that. But it's when the going gets tough that the tough gets going. So I'm right. we're looking and forward to that. Okay. Uh, how do you see this playing into their stock prices? Uh, any um, any big movers expected at this point? I think, to a large extent, some of the banks are underpriced. The stock prices are under, you know. But I. I'm somebody who likes to buy into weakness and sell into strength. Mm. So I like the tier two banks. Why do I like tier two banks mainly? But the tier one bank that we were talking about, First Bank, because they, they, their, their stock was shredded by the market. People just wrote them off. So there's a lot of upside for them for them to get a fair value. So it's something you, it's a buy, right? Um, the other ones are consolidating their position, economies of scale, you'll see. UBA, Access Bank, then GTCO. Yeah, I have to say that. Right. I like uh, FCMB. I'm, I have to for the, disclose that I'm, I'm part of that process. So okay. FCMB, Fidelity Bank have very strong. Uh, the ones bank. to watch out for. Over tier two and uh, Sterling, as well as IBTC. So uh, the banking space is pretty well positioned. Right. I how they, how they will stave off the competition from the telcos because. Uh, Telcos are the most ruthless competitors. Right. And uh, it's a big competition with the mobile there. payment system, it's not going. To be, it's going. To, it's not going to be funny. But like I said. All right. We'll keep tracking to see how they uh, progress. Uh, we'll have to leave it there now. Uh, Mr. Bismarck Rani, CEO of Financial Derivatives Company. It was great having you on the program. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, so after the break, uh, we look at the banking sector performance and expected impact of uh, interest rate tightening on this sector. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. All right, now to our next conversation. As electioneering activities kick off, let's look at how all of these activities will impact the banking sector. We have uh, Damilola Olukwan on our financial market analyst with Chapel Hill. Dan, join us right here on the, on the show. Uh, great to have you. Yeah, thank you for having me, Ladi. Yeah, so uh, Damilola, we're, we're expecting, you know, inflation globally now is the uh, talk of the town, and we've seen that, you know, still in job. But now we have, you know, elections uh, uh, coming up. Spending is going to keep uh, going up at this point. What can we expect with the inflation rate? All right, thank you very much. Uh, my expectation for inflation, you know, going into the month of May, um, is that we expect to see, you know, the pressure, you know, that started in March um, to filter into the month of May. Um, that is, we expect to see uh, higher headline inflation, you know, for the month of May. Um, which is broadly in line with, um, I mean, what has been playing out in the global scene, you know, where we've had um, inflationary pressure. We just spoke 
um, developed markets, you know, like the US, uh, UK, and, and, and also the Eurozone as well. Uh, but then in our own case, um, rather than um, election-induced spending, um, the inflationary pressure you know, we've seen, seen on the Nigerian front, you know, has been largely driven by um, pressures, you know, coming from the food side of things, and also pressure, you know, coming from the core inflation basket, you know, which is largely driven by uh, the energy and um, the PMS um, price. I mean, the scarcity of of, of, of PMS, you know, alongside uh, the energy-related issues, you know, we've had um, so far. So for us, the expectation is that um, May inflation, you know, should print um, to the upside. Yeah, well, uh, that's the consensus, you know, at this time. But how do you think, you know, the CBN will respond to this? We're seeing the Fed, you know, analysts are expecting the Fed uh, meeting tomorrow. They're going to raise, some are calling for 75 uh, basis points. Some are still uh, saying about uh, 0 0.50. But how do you think, you know, Nigeria CBN will react to uh, this? And how will it impact bank earnings? All right, thank you very much. Um, for us, in terms of um, how we think the CBN will, will react, um, we've seen the CBN, you know, just take a, a proactive stance, you know, to rein in on headline inflation, you know, by raising um, the NPR rate, you know, by 115 basis points to 13 percent. And, um, you know, uh, the expectation is that that should moderate, you know, the pressures, you know, we've seen on inflation. Um, whilst we um, at Chapel Hill, you know, we think um, uh, inflation is largely driven by um, structural bottleneck. Um, we, 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 we see little or no pass-through of, of, of the IIMPR, you know, bringing down inflation. Um, nevertheless, um, at the next MPC meeting, um, we think um, the MPC might just adopt a wait-and-see approach, you know, to allow for um, the 150 basis point hike in MPR you know, to allow for, 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 for the impact, you know, to, to, to be reviewed, you know, going forward. Um, and forth, we think they might hold rate, you know, at the, at the coming meeting. In terms of how this affects, you know, bank earnings, uh, I mean, it's pretty much a direct impact. Uh, I mean, the deposit rate, you know, and, uh, is typically an offshoot of what uh, the, the, the monetary policy rate, you know, is. And um, given that the, the, the MPC committee, you know, had voted to raise um, interest rate higher, um, we expect to see um, banks, you know, just book um, higher interest expense, um, which should um, pressure earnings, you know, especially top-line earnings. And for us, we think um, the banks who are the receiving end, you know, will be the tier two bank, um, which have um, inferior uh, um, um, retail deposit, you know, compared to the tier one banks, you know, which have um, 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 cheaper um, deposits in their books. So um, overall, we think um, the the ICANN, um, the inflationary pressures, you know, which have given birth to um, the ICANN NPR, um, is not without impact, and um, the banks might, might might feel the impact in their in their earnings, you know, come um, half year. And and uh, Damilola, there are concerns that you know the elections will trigger massive withdrawal of funds, you know, from the banks. What do you think? All right, thank you. Oh uh, well, um, there are concerns that um, the elections, you know, would, would trigger ma massive withdrawals. You know, I've also read um, some articles online, you know, where people are postulating that that this might be the case this year. But then, if you look at the data historically, um, we haven't seen um, that play out, you know, for most banks. Um, it will, um, what we've seen, you know, over the last two years, you know, is banks um, being aggressive, you know, with their deposit mobilization. And in fact, you know, the human numbers that have been released, you know, also show that um, banks have, have, have also shown this resilience, you know, in growing their deposits, um, which has also filtered into, into loan growth as well. So um, whilst um, the electionary, you know, might lead to a movement of funds. Um, we think um, bulk of these funds, you know, still find their way um, into the banking system, and um, we might not see uh, um, the, the supposed um, sizable withdrawal of funds, you know, affect um, the bank's ability um, to grow their loan books or to carry out their business. Uh, what about uh, loans? Do you see the scope for higher bank lending at uh, this period? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, coming into from 2021, you know, down onto this period, 
Um, we've seen banks, you know, just resort to growing their loan book, you know, as a means to show up in it. Um, you would recall that um, from, uh, I mean, start of 2021, um, the banks um, failed to report um, sizable earnings from investment securities. Um, so in a bid to show up, of, of, to show up um, the tepid growth um, in um, investment securities, um, we've seen banks, you know, just grow their loan book aggressively. And going into the election cycle as well, we think this trend will continue as um, aside um, growing um, interest income from loans, um, there isn't um, any catalyst, you know, coming from um, other line items. And um, we, like I mentioned before, um, we think this trend will continue, not because it's an election cycle, but just because um, the banks are left with no choice, you know, than to um, maximize, you know, any coming from, 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 the, uh, from the loan um, side of things. All right, what about uh, impact on asset quality? What are ex your expectations there? Um, coincidentally, um, the last two election cycles, you know, have, have pointed to um, asset quality issues. Um, if you look at 2015, um, average uh, non-performing loan ratio, you know, was, was somewhat higher than the prior year. And um, that was the case in 2019 as well, you know, where we had um, the election. Um, so um, I wouldn't necessarily link that to um, election-related activities. As those periods have also coincided, periods where um, we had lower crude oil prices, you know, we translated to um, pressures um, in the bank's um, loan book. So for coming into 2020, um, I mean, into 2022, we've also seen the banks um, grow their loan book aggressively, um, which would also mean that um, in terms of impairment charge, uh, we might also see them report um, higher cost of risk, you know, coming into 2022. And um, in terms of asset quality issues as well, um, we've seen banks, you know, concentrate um, bulk of their loan book expansion, you know, to the retail segment of their portfolio. And that segment of their portfolio, you know, is highly susceptible to risk. Um, so we might see um, slight um, uh, um, uptick, you know, in NPL ratios or, or, or slight deterioration in banks' um, um, uh, um, loan book. But um, I don't think it would be uh, as high as the alarming rate, you know, we had um, at the last um, election cycle, you know, in 2015 and maybe in 2019. I think, uh, you know, the, the upcoming elections will drive, you know, sell-offs across the Nigerian stock market. Yes, um, prior to now, you know, what we've had is um, during election, election cycles, um, we've had a massive repatriation of funds. Uh, but then um, the 2023 election cycle is a peculiar one as um, it coincides with a period where um, foreign participation in our market is somewhat low. Um, as at the last data release, um, foreign um, holdings of equities um, in Nigeria is only about 13 percent, you know, which is um, a moderation from about 22 percent, which was where we closed um, 2021 and a significant um, decline, you know, from, from 2015 and 2019 levels. So um, to that end, we might not see um, sizable, um, sizable sell-off, you know, in our market, as um, this sell-off in the past, you know, has been um, largely driven by um, the foreigners, you know, just exiting, um, 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 the, just exiting the Nigerian stock market, you know, due to um, election-related concerns, you know. Um, given that um, the foreign holdings of Nigerian equity is somewhat low, um, we might not see a um, sizable sell-off in the market. Um, rather, what we'll have is um, cautious um, positioning, you know, in selective stocks, you know, who are deemed um, 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 fundamentally sound and um, uh, or, or, or stocks like maybe international breweries, you know, the likes of Cadbury, um, who are towing um, the path of recovery. So we might not see um, general play in the market. Um, rather, we might see um, selective um, play across fundamentally sound stocks. All right, but do you think it's time to, like, go heavy on uh, bank stocks? You think it's that time? All right, thank you very much. Um, for bank stocks, um, most of our banking sector um, companies, you know, are trading at um, um, historical lows. You know, when you, when, when you look at the price to book, um, the valuation, you know, appears um, very, very attractive. And um, when you look at the bank's um, response, you know, to the competition coming from, um, 
coming from the fintech space, you know, it has been somewhat impressive. Um, so for us, um, we see pocket of opportunities, you know, across um, uh, fundamentally sound banks. Um, in the banking space, you know, our top peaks, you know, remains uh, Access Bank um, with their large um, customer size, um, which uh, could e easily translate to higher end, you know, for the banks. And we also like GTCO as well, uh, because um, when you look at the valuation of the bank, you know, it's trading at, at, at below its um, five-year um, average price to book. And uh, we, all, we also like Zenith Bank as well, you know, because the banks um, um, appears um, position. I mean, I'm in well position, you know, to deliver strong earnings this year. So for us, we think it's a good time, you know, to 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 position in in, in select banking names, especially the fundamentally sound ones. And then we think uh, the dividend yield of opportunities, you know, is also something to to consider, you know, as as a plus um, to to banking sector stock. Yes, All right. um, to your question, we think it's a good time to position. Okay, so it's a good time to go heavy. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dam Lola Lukoro, financial sector analyst with Chapel Hill Dadam. It was great having this conversation with you. Thank you for having me, Ladi. All right, now let's uh, move on to the markets. We have uh, Ini standing by right there with the details. Ini, you heard him. He said it's uh, banking stocks for him. Yeah, well, it's banking stocks uh, because we did see yesterday we talked about equities and we saw that the sector was actually in the red yesterday. Uh, it's uh, gotten a lot of uh, buying interest from investors in the past week. That's why we saw it in the red. So perhaps... Uh, and you know I like to position early. So <laughs> Lupa, uh... no, he's, he's asking uh, uh, interested <laughs> or potential investors to look into that section. But right. I mean, like we always say, this is not an advert for anything. So it's you want to take advice. the risk, please calculate very well before you get <laughs> into the market and right. then you know uh, so just before we get into the market uh, we would like to tell you that last week uh, Nigeria's FX reserve recorded its first reserve accretion in five weeks so it was a bit of good news there that we saw that there was an increase in the uh, Forex reserve even though it's still within the 38 million dollars uh, we do hope uh, that we can make more I mean if this morning oil prices are at 123 then Nigeria can certainly do something about that so let's go to the FX uh, and see how uh, yesterday was, uh, there was, there was a no market day, uh, but today we do see that uh, the, there's a trading, the market's open today. So we start with the FX turnover, FX sports uh, there we see had a weekly uh, transaction of $432.24 million. Uh, we can week change. I mean, on every side, we saw that uh, the, 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 compared to the previous week, it was all in the negative uh, total uh, or uh, the end of the week total of 60 more than 66 percent last week uh, in the iron e window last week we saw that uh, the total value also dropped dropped by 65.5 uh, percent last week a uh, 432.24 million dollars is what was traded last week this is uh, a summary of transactions from last week in the nafex window we saw that uh, the previous amount was 418 for a dollar uh, 92 cobo and then it ended uh, it dropped by 0.1 percent at the end of last week to 419 naira 34 cobo and of course a lot of people will tell you that this official window is not very accessible to a lot of people so this uh, rates uh, more or less is for what we see in the banks uh, going to the fixed income market proper now we do see that if a, a federal government bonds uh, had for the deals 29.01 billion dollars uh, the Treasury bills had 25 deals uh, worth over six billion dollars uh, but it's still a very quiet uh, market I think uh, we do have Ramad Baba to share with us her thoughts and observations especially from transactions last week hello Ramat good morning hi good morning yeah, so um, happy democracy day. yeah, happy democracy day to you too, Ramata. Ah, uh, well, good for you because I think you rested yesterday. The market was not trading yesterday, but we're back at work today. So, um, the market has it picked up in the fixed income space. Yes, we've seen increased activity um, from last week. That's right after the NCB auction result was released on Wednesday. Activities increased majorly on the bonds and the treasury bill space. Um, even though we saw a lot of um, cherry picking on bonds, 
we saw yields coming lower and generally activities has increased significantly. Well, what's happening with the yields? We thought by now that uh, it should be, there should be an uptrend. Yes, so um, yields actually went higher after the last bond auction. Uh, market is currently trading higher than the last open it was. Um, at the auction, we had the 25, the 20, 30, 32, and the 2042 bond on auction, and the stop rates were 10%, 12.45, and 13%, respectively. Currently, the market is trading at levels higher than what we had at the auction, but there seems to be a bit of demand coming into that space. Um, for one reason, probably because of the lower stop rates at the NTB auction. And also because um, going into July, we're going to have a lot of liquidity coming into the system from coupon payments, that's one on that side. And also because a lot of the PFAs in recent times, okay, from the start of the year, we've been expecting rates to go higher. So a lot of people have tried to stay in the money market space. Mm. But of course, for how long will they keep pulling up at this point at sub 10% level? So we've seen a lot of these PFAs and a few other market participants coming into the market to just fill their positions on bonds and all that. So mm. pretty much, yes, we've seen yields going lower from Thursday, Friday up until now, but there's an auction next week, and then there might be a bit of correction again. Mm. What, are, what are we expecting at that auction? I think it's on Monday, you said? Yes, auction on Monday, settlement on Wednesday. Um, mm. General expectation is yield should be higher, but the truth of the matter is if we continue to see this demand coming in, we might just be sure that what the outcome of the auction will be, because at the end of the day, the auction will be um, a fallout of what market is doing at that point in time. We still have about four, five, four trading days today up until Friday. So going into Friday, we should have a clearer picture of what the auction stop rates will look like. We can't really give a clear cut now. All right, and I think we're expecting a new calendar for bond auctions. Yes, a new calendar will be released for the next quarter, so we expect that calendar to come in another two, three weeks' time after the auction. Ends, we expect a new calendar that should really set up, um, the tone of activities in the market. Will it be the same bonds currently on offer that will be or on offer again next quarter? Will there be new bonds being issued and all that? So, of course, if, they're going to, if there's going to be a new issue, if a particular bond maturity is going to be reissued, we expect to see yields going up on that particular maturity. So, yes, that's going to set the tone for trading at the end of June into July. All right, uh, Romad Baba, fixed income dealer, FVN Quest, thank you so much. Uh, I think another expectation in that space would be since the federal government has suspended or maybe cancelled, you know, uh, the euro bond uh, ambition for now, we'll see them look inwards. We expect that. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. All right, uh, Ladi, I think that's it. Uh, that's, all the, that's all the time that you have given me here. You're the boss here. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> all righty. So uh, after the break now, we head to London. That's in a moment. Just stay with us. All right, now let's uh, take a look at the crypto market. We're seeing the sell-offs continue this morning. Uh, the uh, market cap for the crypto markets lost that $1 trillion mark. It's now at $956.52 billion, down about 6.88%. Uh, we see the Fear Greed Index this morning below 10 points, st sticking at eight points now in extreme fear this morning, showing the sentiment in the market uh, right now with those sell-offs we see. And uh, looking at price of Bitcoin, $22,484, down 10.98% this morning with a massive volume there at $73.26 billion. Seeing that from a liquidation uh, in the market. And we see Ethereum, $1,219, down 7.39%. Over to the uh, top odds by market cap, we just have one green there. Surprising, just Cardano is up about 8.11%. The rest and the red with BNB there, Binance token down about uh, 4.25. Talking about the top odds by market cap, it's uh, mostly red on that counter with XRP losing that 40 cent mark. It's down about 0.66%. All right, let's bring in Olumide additional now, financial market analyst. Hello, Olumide, great to have you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, hello, Ladi. Very yes. mixed uh, morning today. Yes, quite mixed. And uh, Lumida, I know you are not surprised with the prices we're seeing because you kept on yapping about it uh, a few weeks ago. You talked about how uh, Bitcoin price could 
uh, go even lower when we're still uh, flirting with that 30,000 range. But now you have it, it's, it's down, it touched 20,000. What next? Yeah, uh, so um, the rationality behind the investors' um, nervousness is the fact that um, we need to look at the uh, high inflation making major airlines that are around the world. And generally just reduce their inflation number, the highest and their unification. So definitely that really created some form of um, nervousness. And that's why we saw sell-offs in different markets, including um, U.S. stocks and the bond market. But going to the crypto markets, I, I think uh, more systemic contagion was um, triggered by the fact that some crypto lenders have uh, had issues with uh, the lock of cellulose that has about 150,000 Bitcoin, you know, uh, trying to restrict their uh, withdrawal. So that created some form of panic. And it got escalated yesterday when Bitcoin, uh, B, um, Binance suspended um, Bitcoin withdrawals. So that was uh, due to technical difficulties. That also triggered much more panic. Uh, but having said this, you know, all that is looking on the US where they, you know, uh, today's meeting uh, and we concluded by tomorrow, any increase by some five basis point, one hundred basis point, we definitely push Bitcoin below twenty thousand dollars, Ladi, because that really tells you that the U.S. Fed is all out to fight inflation rather than uh, ignoring the fears of uh, recession. Right, all about fighting inflation right now. Talking about recession, is recession really that bad for risk assets, Olumide? Briefly. Yes, of course, it's Ladi. Very, 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 it's very sad for it because uh, one of the things you need to understand that during recession. Investors will focus more on core services. They would rather invest or buy things that of necessity rather than looking for uh, growth in investment. So, what investors are looking right now is capital preservation, and going to risky assets seems not to be the solution. And that's why we are seeing uh, the crypto market uh, valuation dropping below one trillion dollar because there's an exodus of funds outside these markets, including U.S. stocks. So, naturally, utility stocks, energy stocks. Uh, we, we see some upsides and uh, commodities. So it's pretty much a very damning look for risky assets. Right, and uh, we see the Nasdaq and uh, all of them taking a beating uh, yesterday, and yeah. it's, uh, they're calling it the bear territory at this point. Anyway, we'll see how the market plays out, if there'll be some kind of relief. Thank you so much, Alumide. Thank you. All right, now let's uh, head on to London now. We have uh, Juliana standing by right there. Great to have you, Juliana. Good morning. Well, we have more data this morning, and it's UK unemployment rate. It's up. And uh, regular pay is, is continuing to fall behind inflation. How, how's this data being read over there? Good morning, Laddie. You're right. A mixed uh, set of uh, figures from the Office for National Statistics about the labour market. In fact, in, even though uh, we know that unemployment is at record lows, in fact, 50-year record low, it did start to stabilise. So in the quarter, we saw that unemployment actually rose uh, by one percentage point um, to 3.8% for the three months to April. But uh, the headline that all the business pages are running with is about wages. We know for, for the first time, uh, wages of stagnated to record lows, the most low it's been in about a decade. This is all linked back to the cost of living crisis. We know that inflation is currently running at a 40-year high. It's putting pressure on wages because people are starting to see uh, that what they're getting paid isn't going um, as far enough. And I think it puts pressure on the Bank of England on Thursday when they meet in Threadneedle Street uh, to, to, to hike the interest rates up by a quarter of a percentage point. Right. And uh, Elon Musk is back in the news again with uh, Twitter. And uh, he's, he's having his first meeting with, with the Twitter staff since the, uh, his bid for about $44 billion. What do you think is going to tell them? It's a good question. I suppose we'll have to wait and see what happens on Thursday. Exactly. It's a virtual meeting. It's the first time uh, that Elon Musk is going to be meeting with Twitter staff. Most of them are pretty annoyed, really. They don't uh, like the way um, he's been using the platform uh, to kind of dismiss uh, the social media giant. I think there was a big spat, wasn't there, about the number of bots and spam users um, on the platform. In fact, because uh, the CEO said he wasn't going to release that data, um, Elon Musk said he, he may pull away from the deal. However, 
Father, we did um, hear that last week he did get all of that data on the amount of users uh, that are uh, basically uh, spreading disinformation. And so on Thursday, he will meet with them. Hopefully that will allay uh, some fears. According to uh, the Twitter shareholders, they will be meeting on Thursday to finally uh, vote to see whether or not uh, the world's uh, wealthiest man will take over the platform and reignite it as um, he's proposing to do. Right, and we're all watching, waiting for this takeover to actually happen. But do you think it's going to happen? Yeah, that is a $44 billion question, but exactly. I think so. Of course, um, they are going to be meeting on Thursday. We know that uh, Elon Musk is controversial. He's been ram ramming up uh, the controversy uh, on the social media platform. But Thursday's virtual meeting is going to uh, be a tell-all. Lots of uh, Twitter staff will be given the opportunity to ask Elon Musk questions. Will this be made public? I think it will be. So there'll be a lot of food for thought and analysis for us to discuss on right. Friday morning, laddie. That's going to be a tell-all. Watching out for uh, all the details from there. Thank you so much, uh, Juliana. See you at 1.30. See you at 1.30. Thank you. All right, now let's uh, head back uh, to the markets there. Looking at the top alt by market cap, we see uh, it's uh, mostly red. The market is quite mixed this morning, but uh, in the crypto market, we're seeing the top five gainers there, double-digit gains, a couple of bounces happening in the market. We see Gala Token there leading about 21.94%. Uh, Phantom back in the top gainers counter. That was trading, uh, trading at 25 cents now. Got to a high of about $3.00 in the, uh, the previous uh, uh, bull cycle, it's down to 25 cents, a massive uh, drop there. And we're seeing that across most of the altcoins in the market. And Axie Infinity also on that counter with a double digit gain, seeing a couple of bounces in that market is up about 15.01%. Uh, and we see Tita there up 17.41%. Look at the top five losers now, which are also double digit losses, uh, but much uh, leaner than what we saw yesterday. And we see a Monero there down 14%. Uh, Clay token, uh, that's down by 11.42%. And we see a Bitcoin on that counter uh, down 10%. Not seen Bitcoin on that counter in a while. And KuCoin shares uh, the uh, token for the KuCoin exchange. That's down about 9.12%. So it's quite a mixed market uh, we're seeing in the crypto space. All right. That's it uh, for the crypto space, and that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Do remember to join us at 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more uh, business updates. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.